Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Cross and Crown Radio, and I'm Mike Robinson, your host, also the Gospel Truth Podcast. And with me, a very special guest here, a Christian apologist, Jonathan Sheffield. He's on the front lines of as a public debater and speaker, produces wonderful YouTube shows that we're going to get into a little bit too. And you can check out his channel. Make sure you check out his channel at Jonathan Sheffield on YouTube. And it's spelled with two A's in Jonathan and two F's in Sheffield. Welcome, Jonathan. So good to have you today. Oh, no. Thank you for having me on your show. A uh, big fan. And um, thank you for uh, bringing me on here to uh, share what I've been doing the last few years. You bet. I, I've really enjoyed your work. Um, I've noticed that you are really got some different angles on apologetics, which I always really like to see because so many atheists have heard all the same things. They seem to have pat answers sometimes. But you tend to find little nuances and such to bring out different issues, which is pretty exciting. Now, I know many people have benefited from your uh, recent debates and such. Uh, what is your work right now particularly aimed at, would you say? Um, I, I think at a high level is to really regain the intellectual high ground for Christianity that I feel that we've given uh, some ground to since the time of the Enlightenment. And I think uh, the other uh, purpose of it is to, almost similar to... Uh, the child from the crowd calling out, uh, <laughs> saying the emperor has no clothes. So it's mm -hmm. really to create an awareness from a standpoint that uh, what's going on uh, in our world today, uh, we need to expose uh, that you know people are following the emperor who has no clothes. Yes, that, that is a really good way to put it. That kind of gives us a big picture of what we're dealing with with these worldviews and such. Uh, as you've been studying and your, you know, your scholarship and, and your debates and your speaking, what kind of evidence or proof for the Christian worldview do you find the most compelling that really kind of lights you up a little bit? Uh, say it one more time. What kind of evidence for the Christian worldview or proof do you seem to really like that you, you think is really a strong evidence that really needs to be uh, pressed on non-believers or at least offered for those who are seeking? Well, I, you know, I think in some ways when we look at the uh, what we're saying, you know, because when we look at all other religions, they're they're typically philosophical in nature uh, that most people can either you know accept or reject. Whereas Christianity has the empty tomb, which is yeah. empirical evidence that Christianity is true. That that's powerful because Muhammad's still dead and buried. You can see his grave on, on YouTube, same with Buddha and so forth. But Jesus, I think in one of you, it was a debate or an interview you had, you really gave a great exposition on how so many religions are, you cannot test them. You cannot disprove them. They cannot be falsified. Would you uh, kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I did an animation really targeted at uh, Sam Harris and uh, the atheist community as a whole is, you know, what separates Christianity from the other religions is, um, you know, we have an empirical standard of evaluation. So when we look at, uh, you know, other religions, well, most religions you can't falsify because Muhammad had his experience in a cave. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we look at Mormonism, you know, the... Uh, the angel Moroni came and delivered the golden plates, but how are you able to test those experiences? <laughs> Christianity, you know, we have a God who entered history in Jesus Christ, and so we have a framework uh, to actually test or falsify the claims of Christianity because uh, we have an actual historical event, we have real places, we have real people that can be investigated. And this is what we saw, you know, the Roman Empire doing when they were questioning Jesus and Paul and bringing them before investigation is they were bringing Christianity to see if they can falsify their claims. That's powerful. It's, it's almost similar to a kind of a, a relatively modern one where the Ayatollah during the war with Iraq would send his uh, martyrs with keys to the kingdom. And the, the, the young guys, the young soldiers, unfortunately, believed that gave them access to heaven. But there's no way to test that. 
right? And there's no proof for it. It's just the Ayatollah's claims. Yeah, so with, uh, you know, Christianity, what we did see at the very beginning with uh, the Roman Empire is they set out to test Christianity and to investigate it. Uh, the Roman Empire did this similarly with other cults, as uh, Levy describes when they investigated the, the Bacchus uh, cult religion. And they did the same thing with Christianity. Uh, but the one thing we don't have from the Roman Empire is any tomb or final verdict uh, discrediting what Christianity said. And if we apply this to the modern times, we have no verdict from the prosecution that what Christianity said was incorrect. We can explain what happened with Muhammad, his rise to power. Uh, we can explain uh, the Mormons, uh, the beginnings of many groups. But mm -hmm. what we can't uh, explain, uh, or what uh, atheists can't explain, is where is the bio, uh, body, or from Dr. Robert Price, who created the myth of Christianity. So what is the naturalistic explanation to explain what happened if it wasn't the apostles? That, that's powerful because I, I think you said it re really well. I think you were talking to uh, SJ and you mentioned something. All they had to do was produce the body and this thing's over. Yeah, and, and, and it's not only the body, which is obviously would uh, silence uh, Christianity for the rest of time, but uh, in normal courts of law, you know, you have uh, the body of evidence. So mm. if you didn't have the body, you know, what explanation do you have from the people at the time to explain what has happened? Uh, and the only attempt that we have to explain what was happened was I think a third or fourth century uh, letter that was uh, produced, I guess, out of the, the, the false acts of Pilate uh, <laughs> right. to help explain. And, you know, unfortunately, they have Pilate digging in his well for water. Uh, I don't know what emperor would actually serve himself his own water from the well. It'd be a slave person and discovering the body of Jesus. But what we don't have is any official record. And if you think about it, we have Josephus. We have uh, Levy, we have Tacitus, we have Pliny, we have all these great historians. And what we don't have is a response to Christianity. Because they'll mm -hmm. talk about, you know, Josephus wrote, you know, a uh, number of his histories. He does have so-called maybe disputed accounts. But what we don't have, and Josephus was at the court of Rome, is mm -hmm. any response to Christianity explaining what has happened. Yeah, and like you said, Josephus's response, and of course people go back and forth on how much of Josephus is actually from his pen. There's a lot of good arguments that would say pretty much most of it is because there's a lot of Hebraicness to it. But Josephus, he says that Christ was risen, you know, and he's a Jewish guy, part of the of Pharisees before he became part of Rome and a Roman historian. Oh, no, I, I, I agree, you know, and while some things may come up under the debate, one thing that's not under the debate is there's no response from Josephus uh, to discredit what the Christians had uh, published all over the ancient world. Yeah, and then there's a lot of documents you mentioned, some of them, Tacitus and Thales and so forth, Pliny, where the, the arguments are, okay, there was some kind of outbreak here in Judea, the guy is uh, said to be risen. There's miracles going on and uh, things that we have to deal with. But nowhere does it say there was ever a body found. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, uh, and they had no response. And if you think about it, not only did you have uh, the Roman Empire that did have state power that was investigating uh, Christianity, but uh, you also had uh, the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, uh, so you had two other well-respected intellectual groups uh, that weren't obviously on the side of Christianity that could have produced the tome refuting what Christianity says. And we have a lot that has come down, but what we don't have is any credible tome from the ancient world refuting Christianity. Uh, obviously, you know, Celsius uh, put... Uh, put forth an attempt that Origen responded to. So while there were attempts to try to explain away, there's no credible tomb refuting what Christianity had to say during the first three, four hundred years. And that's powerful. And then, of course, you alluded to some of the rabbinic literature, which predates Christ 
is the time of Christ and just after Christ all the way to about 200 AD. And the Talmud's a massive volume. You know, if there was ever any evidence that they had that Christ wasn't risen, because they talk about Christ, they would put it in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and the interesting uh, thing about some of the Talmudic literature, is, yeah, first, there's no official response. And the only way they describe uh, Jesus is sort of as a sorcerer as sorts, mm -hmm. uh, which does give the history uh, to him as an actual person. Yep. And because uh, if you think about it, a lot of the arguments uh, that some of the modern atheists, such as uh, Robert Price and Dr. Richard Carey has proposed. So instead of having to deal with the body, which does create uh, a large problem for those uh you know, trying to answer Christianity is to say, okay, well, <clears throat> the whole Jesus idea is a myth, but, you know, Carrier and both uh, Price get into a problem is, well, now you have to explain who created the myth. Uh, you have to understand who established all these churches all over the Mediterranean. How did wow. you get all these churches uh, to basically agree when you had this whole <laughs> sect of Noxus that produced all this literature, uh, that uh, they agree amongst themselves. So uh, that's where they get into uh, bigger problems because it's like to deal with the body, it's like, well, it was a myth. Well, who created the myth then? And they get into this circular problem of describing what had happened. Yeah, that's what I enjoy about uh, some aspects of your apologetics. You really press that on them because there's no real answer for it. And that's generally not uh, brought forth and asserted with the force that you do. And so I, I really, uh, I'm going to start using that more in my my approach. I really enjoy that. So I appreciate your work on that because I think that can really help people. Because for me, I, I, I don't know Carrier like you would know, obviously. But for me, as a person who hasn't really read his work or has gone on his blog, he seems like he's kind of a wacko as far as uh, his academics. Is that too strong of a term? How would you describe his work? Well, I... You know, I think a lot of uh, Dr. Carrier's theories, because uh, before we set up the debate, you know, we had time to sit down and kind of understand where each other was coming from. Uh, I did read uh, several of his works, including uh, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, uh, that really went into his theory and really attacked uh, the New Testament. But if you think about it, a lot of the theories that have been created over the last two, three hundred years uh, really serves as the foundation uh, for Dr. Carrier's and Dr. Price's theory, uh, because as they proposed that uh, the New Testament was a byproduct of either later Gnostic uh, invention or a response from uh, the Orthodox Church to the Gnostics, uh, they try to take a, a play that, well, all these stories and views you know, kind of point back to uh, uh, Jesus as a mythological feature. Uh, and with Carrier, you know, he really takes what has happened in modern textual criticism and he goes the other way with it, that uh, the Bible itself, yeah, well, if it's been redacted or changed, he takes it to the next level. He said, well, if there was all these changes and all this corruption, then we need to really pose the question did this person really even exist? Uh, for for Dr. Price, Dr. Price actually takes um, Marcion's claim that Jesus was never really a real person and builds up his theories on that foundation. So I, I get where you know people see that uh, Dr. Carrier and Price take kind of extreme views. So they're kind of mm -hmm. outside, mid-center, where I guess modern scholarship would see them, but they build up on a very uh, sound theory to promote their views. And while it sounds uh, pretty out there, I, I understand the basis for where they're coming from. Yeah, that's. Uh, I would hate to have to try to, to defend that position that Christ didn't exist. Even um, Bart Ehrman, who's what the atheist slash agnostic, uh, you know, he says it's clear that Christ uh, lived and existed and died. Uh, so, and his followers claim that he was resurrected. So uh, I, I don't know how Carrier and these guys can try to defend that. So, <laughs> but I'm glad that you were able to, you know, uh, work with him a little bit, maybe, you know, enlighten the, the guy a little bit. Um, 
as we uh, think about reaching the world out here, there's a lot of folks at what used to be called the New Age Movement. It's not used that much anymore, but kind of this, uh, you know, freelance uh, spiritual uh, walk that people have that they don't really want a father God figure over them. So for a better term, let's just use a New Age Movement. How would you suggest that Christians in a, an apologetic way reach uh, New Age folks, people that might have kind of an Eastern religious uh, bent? Um, you, you know, it's uh, it's interesting when you look at uh, Buddhism and, uh, I mean, especially when you look at Buddhism, uh, you look at Islam, um, what you see in those Eastern philosophies or religions is more people trying to uh, find their way to God. Uh, you know, when we look at Eastern religions, it's this constant... Uh, uh, trying to perfect yourself up to uh, nirvana, recreating your lives to get yourself ready for God. Um, and, and what you see in Christianity is something different because I understand they're, they're trying to reach a higher purpose. And what you see here in Christianity is God coming to us, mm -hmm. which is a uh, total opposite of what we see in the Eastern uh, religion such as Islam and, uh, and Buddhism, this idea that God comes to us, you know, and, and it's kind of uh, brought into, you know, uh, I love Anselm's treaty on why did God become man? Uh, and it, it really touches on that very point, and that's the difference we see in the Eastern religions. And I think that's the way we have to approach it uh, when we're trying to reach out to those in Buddhism and Islam. That's a powerful point because I think even most Christian apologists, you know, there's so many good ones out there. A lot of folks just kind of focus on Christ's death and his resurrection, which are to be focused on. But the incarnation is is kind of put on the back burner a lot of times when approaching these things. And the way that you said it, yeah, all these world religions are trying to work their way to God or some kind of transcendent reality where God came to us. That's a really powerful point. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I really like that one. I, you know, I, I enjoy talking to guys like you because I know I, I always get a chance to learn a lot. Um, well, today's atheists, though, you know, Jonathan, they seem to be um, a lot harsher and nastier than they were, say, 30 years ago. They were mostly gentlemen in those days. But after 9-11 and then Sam Harris wrote his book, it seemed like they thought, well, wait a minute, we can get, you know, pretty aggressive here. Uh, what do you think is uh, the reason that there's so many of the new atheists are so militant and aggressive? Um, you know, I, I think what they're what we're seeing with uh, the newer atheism is uh, almost uh, since the Enlightenment, what's happening is their view hasn't really succeeded. Like, for instance, when we look at uh, communism which comes out of an atheistic uh, type philosophy, uh, we see wherever it has been set up or tested, it has always failed. And what we're seeing now with uh, the newer atheists uh, is they're sort of in a waiting state right now or the, the next new philosophy. So I think as a result of uh, their system or philosophical ideals failing since the rise of the Enlightenment, uh, there's much more aggressive approach to try to hang on. But I think they're sort of in a waiting state right now, waiting for the next uh, uh, the next philosophy. And um, it, it kind of brings me back to uh, Augustine's statement of, you know, that uh, we have this void in us that since we're created in the image of God, the only thing that can fill that void is uh is jesus christ so mm -hmm. I, I think um that's why we see all this aggression and anger coming out because they see that their philosophical hold has been failing throughout so when these guys or gals kind of just really jump at a christian and are really you know saying some mean-spirited things just right off the bat especially on social media uh, would you advise, because you seem like you have a real patient attitude, really, you know, you kind of can listen and and talk things out with some folks that have a different view than you. What would you advise uh, all of our Christian listeners that 
they may not have apologetic training, but they get some atheists on their channel. They want to reach out to them, yet they a lot of times start the conversation, call on the Christian names and all that kind of stuff. What would you suggest? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've always, you know, in, in my approach, um, you know, try to, I think, take the higher ground, but really try to engage the argument uh, and, uh, you know, really forcing them to deal with the historical documentation. Um, you know, we know that the earliest records we do have speak about the resurrection. Um, and what I've done in my conversations with um, with atheists is try to put the, uh, really turn the tables on them. I think a lot of their apologetics over the last hundred years has really been geared at uh, challenging the Christians to explain this, to explain that. Um, and I think, I think in some ways people have tried to uh, really discuss from Genesis or, you know, try to go into the Garden of Eden you know, I, I think what we need to deal when we're speaking to the atheists is explaining, uh, you know, how do you explain what happened in the first century? Um, I, you know, I think that's a, a big rallying cry. How do you account uh, for the missing body? How do you account for the fact that, uh, you know, we had all these investigations done at the highest levels of the Roman Empire and there's no verdict or judgment coming out from the Roman Empire. Uh, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, they all challenged uh, the Roman Empire to produce the official acts of Pilate explaining mm -hmm. what happened. And the only thing that has come out is a forged attempt to try to discredit Christianity. But there was no answer or judgment from the Roman Empire on what had happened. Yeah, so that assumes uh, that there was a Doc, there was documentation already written that backed up the Christian claims. And so when they argued it in front of Roman officials, they said, go check it out. And there's nothing contrary to that. Yeah, I, I mean, if you think about it, uh, when we look at the, the gospel accounts, you know, we have four independent accounts that are basically coming up with the same birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, which unless uh, you can show collusion, it just further demonstrates uh, the truthfulness of it because you can't show where they all came together to inspire to come up with this story, but you have four independent accounts. It was published in Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Coptic, and other ancient languages coming up with the same testimony. And what we see throughout the gospel accounts is name cities. Uh, we have Joseph of Arimathea, who was uh, a prominent person in the area that can be checked out and verified that took the body of Jesus. So we're dealing with names, places, events that were under the control of the Roman Empire in a military police state that could be investigated. It's the same thing as saying if something happened uh, today in Times Square, that there wouldn't be reporters all over the place checking out what had happened. Uh, and what Luke opens up with his gospel and explaining, you know, we have many witnesses to these events, those accounts could be checked out, and they were checked out by the highest levels of the Roman Empire. I mean, uh, Paul met with Festus uh, and, uh, you know, King Agrippa, all these high officials. I mean, how many times, Mike, have you met the president or <laughs> your senator? This is essentially what's happening with Christianity. The highest levels of the Roman government are coming in to investigate. Yeah. And like you said, the four different uh, forces with the four different Gospels. Then you got Paul. Most people that are conservative scholars say Paul wrote around 47 AD Galatians. And then the other, uh, you know, books in the New Testament by different authors. That, that's yeah, I think you're right. The collusion would just be pretty much impossible. Yeah. And, and the thing about collusion, you have to demonstrate where they all came together to conspire that this actually happened. And what we will we don't have is any uh, narrative where they did. So if it if it wasn't the apostles, then who did it? What is the documentation to support their alternative narratives? Yeah, uh, perhaps you can write a book on this particular subject because there's there's so much there, you know, and 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 most of us don't have access to that. And and a lot of apologists, 
uh, do not have knowledge of that. And definitely the lay Christians don't know a lot of this uh, particular, you know, you might call them nuances, but they're not. They're historical data that can be checked out. Yeah, and I, I, I do think this is, uh, this is some of the problem that uh, Dr. Carrier and Dr. Price ran into uh, during, our, uh, during our debate. Uh, for, for Carrier, even more, because he's an actual historian. So he, uh, <laughs> he does have a real degree from a real university. And so when I was challenging him to deal with the historical documentation from the time, um, he knew his only response because, you know, for Carrier, he does hold to the Christ myth theory. So whenever you're talking about documents that can be traced back to an apostle, that puts it in the eyewitness uh, during the first generation, during Christ's lifetime. Uh, so uh, I understand why he was so adamant against getting away from those arguments, because it kind of takes... Uh, it kind of crushes his whole view uh, with that. So it, it was interesting that uh, Dr. Carrier, when he had to deal with actual history, which is his uh, field of expertise, he wasn't able to respond with any actual historical documentation to refute uh, what I was challenging him to. Yeah, when you get to the point uh, of his skepticism, trying to make it all a myth, you basically have to get rid of all history uh, uh, before 1000 AD or such. You know, it's just gone. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and this is why, you know, when they talk about the Bible, when they have to discredit the authorship of the of the New Testament, that's where it begins with, because you, you need to take it out of the first and second generation Christians, uh, because then you want to push it further and further away from the actual witnesses. And when you do that, um, you know, it's easier to create a narrative that uh, we don't know where these documents actually came from, um, which helps kind of support his view that, you know, Christ was all made up. Yeah. And of course, there that would be people that tend to be Gentile after the church was mainly Jewish. And yet, like you said earlier, but there's names and places that are mentioned in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Where'd they get this information? Uh, exactly. I, I think, um, you know, you know, one of the interesting questions that I asked uh, Dr. Carrier before uh, our official debate when we were just having a one-on-one -on -one discussion is, you know, first, you know, was Peter, Paul, and John actual real people? And he did admit to that they were. So yeah, yeah, no, they're, uh, they were real people. And I think the, the thing that kind of threw him off, I said, okay, well, was the Church of Rome, was the churches in Asia Minor, such as Smyrna, uh, and all these other places, the churches in Spain, were those actual churches? And, you know, he, he, it, took, it took him a second or two to go over that. Mm. But uh, he realized that now he's having to deal with the historical world. He wasn't able to get into his fables and his fantasy and his speculation. He knew he was dealing with well-documented institutions across a wide geographical area uh, in many different languages. So he couldn't deny that the churches didn't exist. Okay, so if we know that the churches exist and we had people heading them up and overseeing, um, if you're saying, okay, the churches didn't exist, where did all this come from? So it's really building a historical... Uh, documentation say from the very beginning we can trace back the origins to where these texts came from and they're independently witnesses by different groups in different languages who had different theological convictions so how do you rule out independent testimony for testimony that does not exist so his whole narrative is created out of nothing mm. that's compelling when you think of it that way because like you said these Churches are not just some kind of uh, abstract entity in our mind. They were real places with real people in a real Roman uh, culture, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they they weren't made up. And so for Dr. Carrier, it was, it was a little harder to get around the fact that I can't deny that the churches didn't exist because they're well documented. 
So if uh, the churches were created, who created them? And if you're saying the apostles weren't at the epicenter, well, now we're asking you to explain the who, what, when, and where that put all these things in motion. Because what we see out of all these independent apostolic churches, incredible agreement between the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, and if we can source back their origins, obviously we can source back the authors, um, which goes back to the apostles that underwrites your entire theory. So how do you explain all this if it wasn't the apostles? And that's where Dr. Carey had to get off history and get more into his postmodern speculation of really just making things up. What did he say or did he write about the debate afterwards? Did he say anything? Did he concede anything or just kind of ignore it? Or, um, it, You know, it, his closing marks were basically that Jonathan is just so brainwashed and confused that he has to hold on to his convictions. But yet, Dr. Carey did not want to deal with the historical evidence because, you know, I chose discussing the last 12 verses of Mark with him because... You know, if Mark was first and then uh, the last 12 verses are added, it builds into his narrative that the idea of a resurrection was created to support the orthodox view of a physical resurrection. Um, and, that, and that was the basis of dealing with that. But when he was having to deal with the history of those actual churches we know who oversaw those churches going all the way back from the beginning. We can look at them as independent uh, strongholds of Christianity and actually see what scriptures were being read. And when we look at, you know, the independent uh, group and we compare what they had, they all come up basically with the same. So how do you rule them out unless it does go back to the apostles? And that's where... Carrier had a lot of difficulty. He's willing to concede that uh, Virgil wrote the Aeneid, <laughs> a document that we have very low documentation on, but we have thousands of independent witnesses uh, throughout different languages and geographical uh, locations that testify to these same books, naming the same authors, the same 14 letters of Paul, Acts, uh, while there were some disputes, they basically come up with the same testimony. So how else do you rule that out unless it does go back to the beginning? Yeah, I think most ancient literature combined, putting all together, doesn't have as much as we have for the New Testament. Yeah. Yet, <laughs> yeah, so while Carrier will concede that Virgil wrote the Aeneid, another first century document that is a myth is probably one of the most popular myths of all time, that we can document in the first century, uh, first century myth, who wrote it. We could tell you a great deal about Virgil. He was a Roman poet. He was at the court of Caesar Augustus. But we have four gospel publications published all over the ancient world that somehow found their way into all these independent apostolic churches in Greek, Latin, Aramaic, and Coptic, and other ancient languages. And we don't know where any of these documents come from. You know. <laughs> We have a 10th century copy of Lucretius, but no one doubts that Lucretius wrote it, even though we have one 10th century document to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, it, it became very difficult for Dr. Carey actually having to engage the historical documentation uh, during our debate. Yeah, and then in many times in different places, the Christians, the average men, women, and children were persecuted for it. So they, they didn't have a motivation culturally or socially to uphold these things. Yeah, and, and interesting enough, you know, we did have various sects uh, coming out uh, in the Gnostic groups that did try to publish literature uh, in the claims of Christianity. But when we look at all those groups, they all come up with different texts. But when we look at the independent apostolic churches, they basically come up with the same 27 books throughout. So are we to believe people that disagree or independent witnesses where they do? And this is where in any normal court of law, that testimony would be conclusive. Yeah, and the New Testament sources from the four Gospels to Paul to all the other letters, it, it's, it's pretty fascinating. 
even if you late date some of those documents, it's still so early. Uh, most people who uh, have studied myths say it's not enough time. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because Dr. Robert Price, during his debate, uh, my debate with him, was, you know, the New Testament was created somewhere between 140 and 180 AD. So it only creates 40 years, but he he had a very difficult time having to explain why in the book of Acts that Luke mentions, uh, you know, the pro-council over there that only, and it's one of the most uh, dated times in uh, New Testament history, how else, uh, you know, Paul's meeting with the pro-council uh, after 51 AD, how would someone know in 140 AD that that event happened? Um, and then, you know, John, which he late dates the gospel somewhere at 160 or 170, well, you have the pool of Bethesda there that's given that account as an eyewitness. And after 70 AD, no one would have been able to see that pool because Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, it was one of those uh, well-known, up until the late 19th century, uh, most scholars and archaeologists said, well, it was made up because we haven't found it. Once they found the pool with those anchor points, they realized that it's only someone before 70 AD that would have to be an eyewitness to the pool to actually describe it in their writings. Yeah, that's fascinating. And that's why there are some recent scholars that date John as one of the earlier Gospels, not just because, you know, obviously one of the reasons a lot of scholars say John was written later is because a high view of Christology. But that's just presupposing an evolution towards that instead of it just being the natural outflow of what Christ said. Yeah, and you know, what I, I reminded Dr. Carrier and Dr. Price is, you know, these evolutionary schools of thought that came out of the German school of thought in the late 18th century, that's where their origins came from. Uh, it wasn't until Goblet Store in uh, the late 1700s came up that said Mark was first. Uh, and there was very uh, different disputes between Bauer and other scholars at that time that came up with a whole bunch of different theories on the development of canon. But in order to accept a lot of the modern views, they have to reject every historical document from the church fathers, from all these independent witnesses. So to accept modern day theories, you have to reject what the ancient churches, those that were closest to the apostles, uh, testimony came down with. Yeah, I would think that the, the Gospels and much of the literature in the New Testament has to be in the 50s or 60s, maybe the 70s at the latest, <clears throat> because they have such a strong Jewish flavor behind them. Mm -hmm. And after 70 AD, most of the church was Gentile and Greek. And you can see that with the Gnostic Gospels. They have very Greek Hellenistic flavor to them that's not in the New Testament documents. So I, I don't know how these guys can stand on that. I'm just glad you're out there as a warrior <laughs> going at these guys with the truth because it is it is so simple when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think some of their biggest problems is when you have to pressure them to an epicenter, or is, who were the ones behind this if it wasn't the apostles? Mm. Uh, they have to start making up things. Uh, at least with Dr. Price, he did have a historical view that he was able to go to with Marcion, but the Apostolic Church's challenge with Irenaeus and Tertullian challenge uh, Marcion in the same way. When we go to the official churches of Paul and the official churches of the apostles, these are the documents that have come down to us. This is what has been received your version of Luke and 10 letters of Paul were not received by the official churches of Paul. So, you know, once again, it goes back to the independent witnesses uh, as opposed to all these witnesses that disagree. Yeah, and even some of the early church fathers knew the apostle John. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems when you come to those two guys' view. Um, let's go back to atheism now, because recently I, I, I saw of a guy who was an atheist and he came back to Christ. He gave his life to Christ and he put that on his Facebook post and he had this huge firestorm of attacks against him because of his faith in Christ. And he said in his post after all the attacks, not before, but after he got attacked by all these folks, 
He said, you know what? I would not have had all this abuse if I converted to Buddhism or Islam, but it seems only because I came to Christ that you brought forth all this hate. Do you think there's something to that out there? Yeah, and it, it goes back to an earlier point uh, because a modern uh, scholarship these days, they look at Buddhism and Islam sort of as, you know, a, a philosophical stance that you can either accept or reject. And mm -hmm. it does boil back to the point that Christianity has the empty tomb, which mm -hmm. is the empirical evidence that Christianity is true. So when you have to deal with a historical event that can be empirically tested, as opposed to a philosophical uh, view that you can either accept or reject, uh, this is where the criticism is going to come. And that's why you don't see a lot of hostility against Buddhism uh, or even Islam, or even here in the West where there's been a philosophical view towards uh, uh, hedonism, uh, you know, which sort of came back in uh, like with the rise of the Roman Empire. It's sort of <laughs> us in the West, uh, that has been uh, prevailing... Uh, philosophy that has come on that people, you know, feel you can either accept or reject it. Christianity has the empty tomb, and that's why there's so much criticism and attack against it. Yeah, you see some of that uh, growing when Obama had the rainbow flag flying over the White House and, and such. And it seems like for a lot of folks, you can present any view of your social life that you want as extreme sexually as you want to, and it has to be not just accepted, but delighted in. But if you advocate the norms of the Christian faith, you're a really bad guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's, um, you know, and it, it's all, it kind of falls all back into uh, the post, uh, the rise of postmodernism, you know, where everyone's view is sort of correct. Um, you know, that we're coming in from a philosophical standpoint uh, and it's an argument that many atheists go to. They kind of create this postmodern narrative to explain why we accept what we do. I think you're right there. Um, you know, your apologetic ministry's grown. You're really starting to really influence a lot of folks out there. And I'm sure you've heard so many questions over the, the years. What do you think is the most difficult question against the Christian faith? And how would you answer that? Do you have one that you can think about that some skeptics, whatever or branch of skepticism they come from, or atheists? Um, yeah, I think a prevailing view is that our Bible was created at Nicaea, and mm -hmm. uh, Constantine forced it upon the churches, um, and that really gave rise, when the church got state power, to uh, create the influence. Um, and, and first, uh, <laughs> You know, when we look at Nicaea first, you know, both the Arians and the Trinitarians both argued from the Bible and their Gothic edition was basically the same as the Orthodox version that we have today. Uh, it was translated by an Arian, Euphilus, so we know a lot of history on that. And when we look at what happened at Nicaea, it didn't have anything to do uh, with the formation of the canon itself. Uh, but it was actually dealing with, uh, was there a time when Christ did not exist? So while Athanasius, uh, while, you know, the Greek churches gave their list of what they had been received, they never declared what was going to be in the Bible. That only comes up at Trent uh, in, what, 1565, what was the creed? This is what uh, the Bible contains. Everything else that came out of uh, North Africa at the Council of Carthage in 419, uh, the list of Athanasius, was just a testament as to what had c come down uh, from the churches. Because when the Church of Rome rejected Revelation, uh, the North African churches responded back and said, no, this is what had been received by the fathers to be read in church, and this is why we accept it. Uh, so I, I think answering where the Bible came from is probably one of the most difficult Chris, that Christians have to deal with because this opens up a whole 
litany of other questions. Okay, well, if uh, your Bible was created at Constantine, that means it was collusion. They decided it was going to be in there. They banned all those other Gnostic texts from coming in. So basically, you guys created your own orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. So how can we give any rise to this view that uh, the resurrection is true when you you say Mark was first, you added these last 12 verses to your book, you guys just made up. And this is what Dr. Price argues, is that the response from the Gnostics created the text that we have today. Wow, that's that's solid. Like I said, I think you should do a book on some of this stuff. It would be, it would be fascinating. I'll buy your first copy. But you've quoted um, from Justin Martyr to Augustine and uh, a wide swath of different scholars. What are some of the scholars or philosophers or theologians or apologists, whatever, that have really influenced you or really blessed you over the years uh, that have kind of uh, helped your particular ministry? Um. Yeah, I would definitely say uh, some of the ancient authors were Irenaeus and Tertullian, uh, probably some of the ancient. I, I really like the work that uh, Eusebius has done, as well as Augustine, um, Jerome, uh, pretty influential as well. I, I know the Reformation between uh, Luther and Calvin and the work that the Church of England has done. Um, I mean... Fox's Book of Martyrs, um, uh, the works of uh, Thomas Cramer, William Tyndale. And I think uh, from a modern perspective, uh, I definitely uh, those who have probably contributed a lot, probably uh, J.R. Packer, uh, mm. C.S. Lewis. Uh, obviously, my Anglican bias uh, comes out, but there's uh, e- even uh, Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict. Uh, there's a lot of good works that are, are coming out there uh, really answering that I, I've been impressed with from that standpoint. I would tell my viewers, as you named all those ancient scholars, Jerome, Augustine, all these guys, they were so solid. Perhaps some of them had some views that were a little off here or there, but the depth of scholarship that some of these guys can offer, and I think they're a resource that most modern Christians, even most apologists and so many theologians, don't to dig into it's kind of sad <laughs> yeah I, I definitely uh I, I definitely think we should be well read on you know the formation of the churches uh why we have uh the the text of the new testament that we have now even though there was 50 or 100 other texts out there claiming to be the true official text and i think uh understanding it from a historical uh perspective is very important because I think we can't lose sight of the incarnation that God actually entered history in Jesus Christ and uh, one of the things that impressed me is that when Jesus went back before the apostles you know uh, not only did he sit down and eat with them but he's showing Thomas look feel my hand so he's appealing to physical evidence so while there's a spiritual uh, element there that works as well we can't separate uh, the physical from it as uh, well so it's both uh, the physical and the not uh, divine night, uh, nature uh, that we appeal to so obviously everything came together through the working of the holy spirit but god used physical means in order to do it yes and you know with the a lot of young guys uh, what i noticed uh little brief commentary here is when the new atheist came out really strong around 2005 i noticed there was you know dozens of apologetic ministries out there but after that they almost kicked a hornet's nest and now there's tens of thousands of apologetic ministries out there what would you advise as someone who's seasoned and has done a lot of work i mean you've you've tackled some guys that are not easy i have to i have to admit you know i get my head off to you for that but what would you recommend to a guy or a gal, a young guy or a gal? They're going to a Bible college or a seminary or something, and they're, they're really seeking out to be an apologist. What are some uh, advice that you would give them as they start their, their trek into this field? Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. First, I, I think they need to, going back, They need to understand how the churches were uh, set up and organized. They really need to understand the polity of the church in the sense of 
how were they set up and organized and how did this you know amazing revolution organization came about how were they able to spread throughout uh you know the roman empire in a dominant uh, pagan society with all this philosophical thought and succeed how did they become the intellectual class of the fourth century uh and dispel a lot of the claims of the philosophers so i, I think it it does begin with a good sound history of Christianity from the very beginning, taking into uh, uh, the count uh, how we got the Bible as well. Um, and I, I think it's also important to, you know, because while we see that there's growing numbers within the atheist community, they're still in that kind of, you know, waiting or holding cell for that next philosophy so uh and that's why we see with a lot of their arguments you know when they're pressed on how do they account for christianity in a naturalistic way um you know if it, if it wasn't the apostles it isn't what christianity says it was and this is where they get stumped and they try to if you think about it, most of the atheists will try to attack us on Genesis. Okay, well, did the serpent really exist? Was Garden of Eve uh, literal, metaphorical? Well, I wasn't there 6,000 or 20,000 or a million, whatever they want to say, uh, but we can go back to the first century where we is a well-documented time. Uh, and I think that's where they need to focus their conversation of. I think. I think one of the problems that Christians run into is when we become too speculative mm. in our arguments with atheists, because then it opens up the door for them to become speculative as well. So then it becomes a question of, well, I think this, well, I think this, well, who's right? Well, who knows? But when you focus on the first century Christianity and you have to actually deal with uh, actual people, real cities, actual events and all this documentation then they can't get off on their speculation as much so i think they gotta really hold them to the fire in dealing with the ancient documentation yeah that's good advice for those young folks that are getting in there and i encourage i think every christian should get in apologetics at least a little bit you know it's not just a spiritual thing it's not just an emotional thing but it's also an intellectual thing christianity so i would encourage them to take your advice really understand the first century documents, really understand the, the who Jesus is and why we know who he is, very powerful truths. Um, as we, we get close to closing down here, would you uh, you know tell us a little bit how you came to Christ? Were you raised a Christian? It was just something you'd always have been in a sense, or was there a point where you, you know, something happened where you came to Christ? Uh, well, I was, I mean, I was raised a believer from uh, both Christian uh, uh, parents. Uh, I did grow up in, uh, you know, a Christian household. Uh, I did go to an Episcopalian church, you know, primarily all my life. But, you know, I, I've gone to, uh, you know, Presbyterian, Baptist. Uh, you know, I try never to, uh, you know, forsake the assembling of each other, even though there's maybe some differences between us. But, you know... For me, hearing the scripture and it coming to me at a very early age, I mean, just reading through the scriptures, hearing it, you know, uh, really enforced upon me how much I need Christ. Uh, mm. You know, and going through the scriptures and hearing them uh, read at church and then looking down and be like, that's me. This is how much I need Christ. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what really brought me to God, the realization of how much of a sinner I am and the state of my condition. And I was like, I, I can't do this on my own, that um, I, I need to look uh, to Jesus Christ at, at Calvary to take that penalty on for me. So I, I remember just having that deep conviction, hearing those scriptures and taking an inward look and to see how how you know, how much I needed Christ in my life. Uh, and it really developed from there. That's wonderful. That's how I, I feel my kids are. I raised them that way. And it's, you know, I wasn't raised a Christian. I was a non-believer, but it's always wonderful to see the blessing of someone like you that 
in some sense that Christ was always there, almost like another relative, you know, and that you needed him and you knew you needed him because you knew you sinned and, and God's word, you know, revealed your weaknesses and your frailties and, and how much you needed a savior. And that's the key right there is that we need to know that we need a savior because nobody else can save but Jesus. No, I, I agree. And um, as we get close to closing here, um, Jonathan, do you have any plans in the near future? Like, do you have any projects that you're thinking about, like more uh, videos, uh, more debates or, or, or lectures or anything that you would, uh, maybe even books, anything that you have on the table that you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm finishing up my last two uh, uh, debate responses to Dr. Richard Carrier in the form of the animation. So we went through a six week online discussion at his site where we had our formal debate. So now what I'm doing is putting forward a uh, video response to each of those responses uh, from the actual debate. And in the summer, I will be uh, taking the debate I had with Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Price and putting them into an actual uh, animation as well. Wow. I do have a I do have a Halloween uh, <coughs> cartoon that's going to be coming out. It's a surprise. So I don't want to let too much out of the bag, but it's really going to go out uh, discussing uh, about the text of the New Testament and some of the modern theories. But it's going to be done in a nice little Halloween uh, fun way. Uh, and then after that, I'll be uh, reaching out to a number of different uh, possible opponents to sit down and discuss. Probably either a couple more atheists or those within uh, the Christian side as well. Well, that's wonderful. Keep, keep us updated here. I'm going to, when we uh, publish this on Facebook and YouTube and other uh, places, I'm going to put your YouTube uh URL out there so people can click on your link and find it because I'm telling you guys you got to check out the animation these videos are incredible and your your kids your teens uh, someone who's 80 anything in between they will watch these they're very compelling and very well done so check out that at Jonathan Sheffield on YouTube and again that's with two A's and Jonathan and two F's in Sheffield uh, but Jonathan, man, as a fellow Texan now, you know, you're from Brooklyn, New York. I'm originally from L.A. Kind of funny how we got here in Texas, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, great. I, I was in the Air Force, so this is my last oh. This was my last stop, and I decided to settle down here in San Antonio and start up a family. So now I have a beautiful wife, three wonderful kids. Uh, mm. So it, it, it's been great. We'll have to connect, you know, in person at some point if one of us is near the other because uh, you're only about four and a half, five hours away. And, you know, if you're ever coming up to the DFW area or I'm going down there, we got to look each other up. Oh, definitely. I'd love to come down there and break some bread with you and have a really good conversation. Definitely. Yeah, I don't know if you uh, lecture at churches, but maybe you can come to I pastor a church here uh, in uh, Fort Worth. Maybe you can come and, and lecture there if you have any free time one of these times. Oh, yeah, definitely. I would love to come up there and uh, it, it'd be great because I think uh, the, the thing about my ministry, uh, since it's really defending uh, the text of the New Testament and uh, reaching out to atheists and other group is it's open to all audiences. This is something that we can all agree on is that, you know, God exists. He entered into history and the birth, life and death and resurrection of Christ did actually happen. And those are the things that we need to be promoting and educating not only our congregations with, but reaching out because there's a lot of seekers out there right now mm -hmm. that are on the cuffs of, you know, what is it that I'm gonna find a higher purpose in life? And that's why I feel it's important that we give an answer for the hope that is with, uh, that's in us, as Peter says. Yeah, and you're doing a great job. And I know for me, before I was a Christian, I had no idea there was any evidence or proof for the New Testament or for Christ. I thought everybody just, except for whatever religion, just kind of works for them. And people like you sure make it known that, no, guys, take a look. This is fascinating. It's compelling. And the evidence is amazing. So, Jonathan, I thank you so much for joining us today. May God bless you and your family. And uh, everybody out there, make sure you subscribe to his channel. I'll see you next time, my friend.